Next up, oh, this has to be a mistake. He was already here. Uh, no, no, it's not. Uh, so, so last time I saw Peter McKenzie's uh, protocol pr presentation, he was doing uh, magic tricks. So what's today? You're going to cut somebody in half. Come on, Peter. How are we doing? Good. Just give me one second to get set up here. Okay. Um, as many of you know, I teach a lot of analysis courses. And when you're teaching analysis, um, I, I always say it's, it's very difficult to teach people about problems that happen on networks because when you're troubleshooting, you never really see the same thing twice. So if you come to one of my classes, you'll hear me say, what we're going to do is we're going to teach you what normal is. I'm going to teach you how protocols work. I'm going to teach you how the logical order that things should happen in. And why do we teach that? Because when we're troubleshooting, what we're looking for is when things stop being normal. So if you know what normal is, you can start to identify where things go wrong. We also teach how to use tools, so how to use protocol analyzers. Um, and that's all great, but a lot of people come back to me and will say, well, okay, you've told me what normal is, you've told me what the protocols, how they work. I know to some extent how to use the tool, but then I go on site to troubleshoot a problem, and I do a capture, and I've got a capture file that's maybe got 200,000 packets on, and I'm just lost. What do I do at that point? Where do I go? Um, and how do I think about sort of fixing that? So I've been thinking about that and thinking about how do I try and um, show people the steps I go through when troubleshooting, and that's what I'm going to attempt to do today. Um, I guess I'm going to try and give you a little insight into my mind when I'm faced with a packet capture file. And we're going to do that by opening up some trace files um, which I've captured from networks I've troubleshooted recently. And we're just going to go through my process of taking that trace file and trying to identify the problem. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I'm going to start up there with a bit of background between my sort of methodology when I troubleshoot. So this is my troubleshooting methodology. It, um, that I go through when I go on site. Very first thing you need to do is to uh, define the problem. Um, and that is the job of the person doing the analysis to define the problem. It's not the job of the customer you're doing the analysis for. Because very often, they're going to tell you a description of the problem that might not quite be right. So, oh yeah, we've got users that keep getting kicked off the wireless network. Or we've got... Um, we're, we're now an airport, and we're getting lots of interference. We really need someone to come in and, and do some spectrum analysis and troubleshoot a problem. Yeah, we, we've tried changing to non-DFS channels, and we've still got the problem. We've tried doing this. If that was the problem, they would have probably fixed it. The fact that it's still a problem um, likely is that they don't know what the problem actually is. So you need to define the problem. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, later on. Once you've defined the problem and you know what's actually happening, you've then got to set up the data capture. You've got to set up some monitoring of the network. And again, I'm going to speak about how we do that. And But identifying where the traffic is that you want to analyze is a key into that part. Once we set up our monitoring, we then need to see the problem occur. This is incredibly key. You can't troubleshoot something if you don't see it. Now, sometimes it can be really easy to see the problem because it's a problem that occurs all the time, or they can recreate the problem. Other times, and you know, the problem happens sporadically. Maybe it happens, well, it happens maybe every, at least once a week, users are losing connectivity. And you know that the time when you go in, everything's going to be working fine. Um, 
so what we have to do in nursing now is we need to set up sort of longer term captures. And we need to think about capturing over a long enough period of time that we're going to see the problem occurring. After we've captured the data and we've seen the problem occurring, we then need to go through analyzing the data. Um, and that's going to be the part that I'm going to try and show you live today, is how we go through analyzing the data. Um, having analyzed the data, we might get to a point where we say, OK, has that given us, do we need more data now? Have we analyzed enough of it that we know we now need to set up some other captures or we need to look somewhere else? And we might go around the cycle of setting up some more captures, trying to recreate the problem, analyze the data, and going round and round in that circle. Sometimes you get one shot at analyzing the problem. Um, I spent some time, um, uh, there was a customer of ours who brought us in to troubleshoot a problem. It was a warehouse environment, and they were having problems with handheld devices. They'd brought some new voice pickers for the warehouse. They'd brought 200 of them. And when they got to turn in about 90 of them on, the entire network ground to a halt. And when I mean ground to a halt, literally everything stopped moving. Um, and I, they brought me in to troubleshoot it. And the first thing I said, OK, can we start turning some of these devices on? I've got my captures set up. And they went, no. I said, why not? They said, do you know how much it costs when our network stops? We're not turning on the devices. So my question was, how can I, I can't troubleshoot a problem if you don't let me see it. So after about a day off conference calls, I convinced them to allow me to introduce the problem once. And I could only introduce the problem for no more than five minutes was the deal. So I had to make sure that I had all my capture points set up so that when we saw the problem occurring, I got the data I needed. Once we go through this pattern of analyzing the data, setting up data captures, we're then going to come to the problem, the thing of, have we identified a problem? That's the aim of troubleshooting. We want to get to the root cause or, the, or at least an indication of what the problem is. And hopefully, if we identify the problem, we're then going to implement some sort of change. Um, or we're going to recommend that something gets reconfigured, that maybe some radios get changed, whatever that is. Um, once that change is implemented, we then want to set up some captures, observe the problem again, observe the network. Has it changed? Is the problem fixed? Or do we need to implement more changes, do more captures? And we're going to keep going around that cycle until eventually we've got a network that's where, the, where the problem we've observed initially has gone away, and we can sign off and move on. So that's the sort of process I like to try and go through. And let's just go through some of those stats in a bit more detail. First of all, defining the problem. Um, the biggest thing I can tell you is don't make any assumptions. The reason people can't fix problems often is because they start off with an assumption of what the problem is. And it blinds them to what the real problem is. And I have this happen to me an, an awful lot of the time. Um, customers phone me. They don't tend to phone me the first time they get a problem and say, hey, can we pay you to come and fix our network? It's normally when they've had a problem, had it for one month, two months, three months. And by the time they phone me, it, they've been trying to fix the problem for a long time. The reason they can't fix it is very often because they've been made an assumption about what the problem was. I remember um, one company phoned me up and they said, We've just upgraded our network to one gigabit network. We put in a brand new HP gigabit switch, and the network slowed down. We've had HP in to, fix the, to try and fix the switch. They said there's nothing wrong with it. Can you come in to give us some evidence that their switch is broken? Now, straight away, I was thinking, a brand new HP switch doesn't work. It doesn't sound right, does it? And when I went in and actually had a look at the problem, they'd upgraded, obviously, this switch to a gig, all the network cards to a gig, and its old Linux cluster of servers they had couldn't cope with having a gigabit of traffic sent to it. And it, was send and it just wasn't responding in time, and you're getting TCP um, sort of timeouts. So it had nothing to do with the new switch, but they couldn't see the problem because they were fixated that it must be something to do with the switch. And you see that an awful lot of time. Um, so 
talk to the users who are experiencing the problem as well. Because problems can be a little bit like Chinese whispers. The users complained. They've talked to the desktop team, who's gone, oh, it's not ours. Hey, set network team, they're having a problem with the wireless network. And then by the time it gets to the network team, yeah, the, the users keep getting kicked off the wireless network in this place all the time. They keep losing connection. So then you get to the problem, and it's a little bit Chinese whispers. When you actually go and talk to the end user, you realize that they're not getting kicked off the wireless network at all. They've got full signal strength, but they, they, then they keep, the browser keeps not displaying web pages all the time. And it's a completely different problem to what you've been told. So go and talk to the users, interact with them, have a look at their machine, say, what, what, can you show me what happens? What sort of problems do you have? You learn so much more from talking to users. Um, and when you're trying to identify a problem, you want to identify what the problem is, what actually happens, what do the users see? So if they keep getting kicked off the wireless network, do you see your wireless signal strength drop off? Or is it some sort of back-end issue? Who is affected? Is it everyone? Is it just one user? Is it a group of users? Um, where does the problem occur? Is it one particular area? And, and when? Is it certain times of day? So you're building up a picture of what's happening on the network and, and when the problems are occurring. Once you've got that picture, you've then got to identify where we're going to monitor. Um, and there's many places we can monitor. We're wireless engineers, um, but let's face it, every problem is a Wi-Fi problem, yes? It doesn't matter whether it's an air app problem, it's a Wi-Fi problem, because how do people connect to networks today? They connect via the wireless. And it, from a user's point of view, if I connect to a wireless network and I don't get a DHCP address, that's a Wi-Fi issue. And we might want to wash our hands of it and go, oh, DHCP, it's not Wi-Fi. It is Wi-Fi because we're delivering a service over the wireless network to that user, and they should be able to get a DHCP address. If they can browse the web, it might be an application issue, but it's still, from the user's point of view, it's a Wi-Fi issue. The, the services and the applications that they want to receive of that wireless network aren't working. So we need to, um, we need to view our analysis as delivering a service to an end user, and we, ca we can't just be too narrow-minded in how in we look at our bit. If it's not my bit, I don't care. We need to look at it more of the, as, a, as a system, which is why every time I do analysis, I, as well as wireless captures, I always have wired captures as well. I think if you're properly going to troubleshoot, you need to be capturing on the wired network as well as the wireless. Um, we, we can conf the wireless capture tells me is the wireless working from a layer two point of view. If it's anything above that, I generally need a wired capture, especially if my traffic's encrypted. So where can we capture? Well, we can capture on the wireless side. Um, I like to capture near the client because they're experiencing the problems. So we can do wireless capture. We can, for our wired capture, we need to think about where's our traffic going. So if the AP's bridging the traffic locally, then we need to be capturing probably just behind the AP. If all the traffic's been sent back through the controller, let's capture everything going to and from the controller. It might be that um, we need to think a, bit, a little bit more um, about what the user's actually doing and what processes are they using for where we capture. Because if the AP's bridging it locally and that user's going to be mobile and walking around, then we need to think about a better capture point on the wired network where we can see traffic coming from all APs. So maybe in a warehouse environment where they're using mobile computers, barcode scanners talking back to an application server, we're going to mirror all traffic going to and from the application server. And that will allow us to see exactly what's happening. So when we define the problem, I don't know if this is um, familiar to any of you or you, you've seen things like this before, but the wireless is rubbish on here. People are saying that Wi-Fi is rubbish. It doesn't work. It sucks. And then you look, and there's an AP there, the user's here, and yet the Wi-Fi doesn't work. We, I came across this um, doing some work for a customer a while back. We were doing some survey work. Um, they, they wanted us to redesign the wireless because it sucked, it didn't work. Um, as we walk in, there were some coverage holes that needed fixing. 
But as we went round, it didn't matter where we went, everywhere we went, the guy with us who was our escort around this factory kept saying, yeah, the Wi-Fi is rubbish in here. And you kept people going, yeah, it's awful. It never works. We can never connect. And I look in one office we went in, and this woman's going, yeah, we can never connect. And that was an AP above her head. And that was her computer. And I, I said, C can I just look at your computer? And full bad signals. I said, are you having problems at the moment? I said, yeah. Um, so, and we saw this, every, uh, we did three up their factories, the same problem everywhere. Um, so I instantly knew that I can design a new wireless network, and I said this to them, and, it'll be, and you'll install it, but your Wi-Fi will still suck. Because you've got back-end problems. So let's have a look at that problem um, that we saw. This is what I saw on their computer. I'm sure it's probably something you've all seen before, full wireless signal, no IP address, and you get a little orange little explanation mark saying limited connectivity. They were not getting an IP address. Fairly common, fairly common problem. First thing I think is, oh, your DHCP scope has run out of addresses. So I get them to check the DHCP scope, and they've got plenty of addresses in there. So let's actually define what that problem was because it was a little bit more interesting than that. This was only affecting corporate wireless um, devices. It was a WPA2 802.1xp network. The users sometimes got limited connectivity, and it could happen when they first connect or when roaming, but not always. In fact, it was only affecting probably 10%, it was only about 10% of the time they got limited connectivity. The other 90%, it was okay, but it was still affecting quite a lot of users. So the problems were regular but intermittent. So we went in to troubleshoot the problem for them. And th this is what we saw on the wireless side. Um, it looked quite normal. We can see they open system authentication. They associate to DAP. They go through their 802.1x exchange four-way key exchange, and assess and an encrypted data. So all I've done by looking at that is confirm that from an RF point of view and a connectivity point of view, the client is successfully authenticating and connecting to the wireless network. So where do I go from here? Well, I've, this is where I've got to rely on a wired capture. And we had a capture behind the AP running, and I'm just going to show you a slightly filtered version of that capture. So this is just showing the DHCP packets um, filtered down from that capture. Now, as I look through the DHCP trace, I'm going to see a lot of, we can see in the summary column there, you can see some acknowledgments, some informs, some discovers, some requests. And as we look through it, Generally, it seems like DHCP is working okay. People are getting IP addresses. There's been acknowledgments coming back. So, but I need to find my client. When you're troubleshooting, I always have a book with me. I'm old-fashioned, I like to write things down. Um, and it's really important. When I was with the client, and every time the client had a problem, and he, he couldn't get an IP address, we wrote down, we had his MAC address recorded, and we wrote down the time. So we knew where to look. And it's trace while it's filtered down to about the time the problem occurred. But the main thing is, I need to know which his DHCP packets were. And DHCP is broadcast, so I'll see the packets that he transmits, but the ones coming back are going to go to a broadcast address. So how do I identify them? Well, let's take a look in a DHCP packet, and I'll show you how to do that. This is where knowing your protocol is quite important. Inside a DHCP address is always a client hardware address. That is going to be in every packet that belongs to that client. It's going to be the hardware address. So I want to be able to see that easily in my packet view, so I can find my client's devices easily. I, I, can, I can zoom in a bit, yeah, if that's helpful. Let me just do that. I can, I'll have to zoom in and out a bit there, too. So that's within the boot boot P problem. We've got a client um, identifier address. 
Now, one thing I want to do with that is I can take that and I can create a decode column for it, which is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to have to zoom out for that now. So I've just created a decode column. That will, by default, get put at the end. But I'm going to drag it over a bit. So now I can see all the client addresses. Um, and I now just need to find a client I'm looking for. Now, I, have, I could do a search for it. Um, but I, because I know where it is in its trace file, just for speed, I'm going to move to the end of this trace file. Um, and it's this little Intel client here that I've got my cursor over. Now, the first thing I notice when I'm looking at his DHCP packets is, and again, I'll zoom in a bit so you guys can see this, is a NAC, a negative acknowledgement or a non-acknowledgement. Okay, we can see him sending a request for an IP address, and it's been refused. So why is it that it's been refused when other people's have been accepted? What is, what's the difference with this request? I can look at the IP address he's requesting, but it's on the right subnet. Um, and this is where we can look at yet another field within the DHCP packets. Let's see if I can find it in the zoomed in view. So, Within every DHCP zoo, we get um, something called a server identified. This tells me the DHCP server which responded to the client. And it's, so that's another interesting piece of information. Let's add that to our column view and see what that does. So, just gonna have to zoom out a second. We're gonna pull that column over. And I'll zoom back in. Now, one thing you might be able to see as we look at this is there's a really big difference between the um, stations which were succeeded, and these are these ones here, these acknowledgments. We're coming from 32.2, whereas the NAC was coming from 32.1. So when we look at when we're looking at a difference between the two packets, between what's what's the difference between the successful ones and the ones that are failing, we see the main difference is that it's a different DHCP server responding. So that leads me to question: Well, what are those two addresses? Um, and as I talk to um, the network team there, I find that dot two is the local DHCP server. And then I said, so what's dot one? And they said, oh, that's our core switch. And I was like, why is your core switch being a DHCP server? They said, it isn't. I said, no, it is. Um, <laughs> the packets never lie, right? So as we, I said, okay, can we, I said, I bet you've got a DHCP helper configured on your core switch, can we uh, look at the config? Which you shouldn't have because you've got a local DHCP server on your local subnet. So sure enough, we look at the config and there was a um, DHCP helper address, which once we removed, this problem went away. And what they were doing, were they were, and they said, but we've got that everywhere. I said, yeah, you've got this problem everywhere. <laughs> yeah, but it's a global configuration. Yeah, and it's the global wrong configuration. Um, so anyway, after some interesting discussions, they disabled it, and the problem went away. Now, I'd love to show you more about this trace file. There's actually this trace file, when you look, just looking at DHCP addresses, we can identify an actual architectural problem this customer had as well, um, which was why it was happening to some users and not the others. But I want to show you a couple of other trace files and before, in terms of time we've got here. So. I want to show you 
um, how you can troubleshoot voice traffic with an encrypted data file. Because encryption sort of sometimes gets in our way, doesn't it, on a wireless network when we're trying to troubleshoot. You've got a trace file like this, it's just a whole load of encrypted data. And it can be a little bit frustrating um, because we're seeing, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, I'm just going to very quickly show you what I did with this trace file. How do I make this trace file make more sense to me? How do I know if there's a problem? This was me capturing a client's voice call on a, on a network, and they were having voice problems. How can I identify if there's any problems with the voice? Because it's just encrypted data, and it all looks the same. So let's go through the process I'd go through. First of all, this address here, um, I know it's hard to see, but that was my client. I'd noted their MAC address. So one thing I can do is I can insert them into my name table just to give it a meaningful name. Now, I've already done that, and I've called it client1 for this trace file, so I'm going to cancel that and just turn on the name table entries. First of all, that means it's a bit easier to see. The second thing is I want to be able to see when the client sent a frame and when he received a frame. So I want to be able to see the direction a bit easier. So because I've given the client a nice red color, one thing I can do is I can, dis I can say color, view color, and source. Now that's made every row colored by who's sending the frame. What other in interesting information can I see, though, in these frames? If I look at one of these encrypted data frames, when you're looking at voice, you'll see that it has a cross-control field. And one of the bits of information within that tells me what the priority is of that field. This is unencrypted. That's useful, because now I can identify voice traffic from data traffic, yes? So let's make that one of the columns, just the same as we've done before. We're going to edit as a decode column, and we're going to come back over here. So let me drag my new decode column over so we can all see it and use it. There we go. Now, we can see now that the difference between the voice traffic and the bat step at traffic. So we can see which is data, which is voice. To make it a little bit more readable, I'm going to get rid of the acknowledgments and just look at the data traffic. So I'm going to pick a packet that is encrypted data in the protocol, right click. I'm going to select related packets by protocol. I'm going to copy that to a new window. Now I've got a view of just all the data frames going to and from the client. And straight away, to me, something stands out. Let me show you what stands out. I'm going to zoom in so you guys can see it. Just see the column headings? We can see, as we would expect, voice traffic going in two directions. Sending a voice packet, receiving a voice packet. Sending a voice packet, receiving a voice packet. That's what we'd expect. Take a look at the data rate column. In the data rate column, every time the client transmits a voice packet, it's going at 130.3 megabits per second. Every time it receives one, it's going at 24 meg, which was the lowest data rate configured on the APs. So is that because of the, just the path between AP and the client? Well, let's have a look at something else interesting. Look at when the, it sends a best step at frame. When sending data, it sends it at a higher data rate. But every time, and we saw this across the entire office, every time the APs transmitted voice, it was 24 megabits per second. Now, that's an encrypted data frame, but already I'm starting to mean meaning to it by just doing a few simple things. Let me show you another voice trace file and do the same process and look at something else we can see. So 
Same process again. Let's just select my encrypted data frames. This is between two phones that were having a conversation. We were monitoring their conversation. I put them in the name table to make it a bit more readable. Um, I'm just going to zoom in on a chunk of their call. We'll do this bit at the top here. Now, we can see the data race with quite good birth directions now. But look at the cross markings. On here, we've got in one direction it being marked voice, but in the other direction it's been marked back effort. So we didn't have end to end cross in this network. It was being marked voice when it's leaving, when it's coming back, it had lost its cross markings and it was only being marked back effort. So somewhere along the line, we were losing our cross markings. Um, just another thing you can see when using um, an encrypted voice frame. Okay, that scenario I want to take you through. I probably need to explain a little bit about its scenario before we go there, but we'll just open up and one up the capture files as we do. It's quite a big capture file. Um, this was a warehouse environment. They were having problems with these um, picking devices giving slow responses. And when I mean slow responses, they um, were getting sort of four to five seconds, sometimes seven, eight seconds. And after a few seconds, if it doesn't get a response back to a voice command, it beeps in the ear, beep, beep. And the users were, report, were, were reporting beeping. And for those of you that don't know picking operations, it sort of goes like this. A guy has a headset on, he, get, get, he gets told a number 2467, he goes to where 2467 is, and he goes 2467, it says, pick four, and he picks four items, and he goes, picked four, and then it'll say the next thing. 924, and he goes, 924, pick three, pick three, and it'll tell him the next number. And in a shift, they have to do so many picks because they judge their performance on how many picks they do. So when they get in delays, it affects how many picks they can do and it affects the productivity overall of the distribution system. So it's, it, it's a problem for them. So they were getting these random slow sounds. Um, but they weren't happening all the time. Sometimes it occurred, sometimes it didn't. Um, so I had to walk around with all my wireless NIC cards in my laptop I had um, a wireless pro survey tray because these are eight hour shifts and we didn't know when it was going to occur and I'm following the guy around on his pick with my notebook and pen in my hand ready to write down any times that we get any beeping or slow nets. And it took a long time. I captured a lot of data. I had a wired capture in the application server set up and I had my wireless capture. Um, let's have a quick look at this. Um, trace file here, just to give you an idea. Um, now, one thing I will show you actually just quickly is, you'll notice here if you just look, it might be hard to see, but I'll just read out the total number of packets was 1,395,940 packets. This was just one trace file um, out of lots I took from when the problem occurred. So how do you deal with that many trace files? Well, first of all, we want to get an idea about what the wireless environment looked like. So let me just turn off that view just so we can. And I saw a few retransmissions while I was doing the capture. So I wanted to know, was there a lot of retransmissions? What, did we have a problem with retries in, the, in, in that area? Well, if we have a look at this, doesn't look like there's much problem with retries, is it? It's really low level. It wasn't even, you know, one time it might have peaked to about 10%, but it's not really a problem. Or is it? Notice how much of the traffic was beacon, beacon frames. 
and how much was per request. Um, beacon frames, what, what, what are they addressed to? What, what's, what's the destination address of beacon frame? It's a broadcast. Are broadcasts acknowledged? Will a broadcast ever be retransmitted? No. So actually, when we look at the entire, if we're looking at retries and we're just looking at an entire capture file, that's merely broadcast management frames, we're not going to see a lot of retransmissions. What I'm interested in is how many retries are happening to my data. So I'm going to take my encrypted data, right click, select related packets, copy to a new window. Now, does that change what my retries look like? We'll just let it go. Oh, it does. Now, that is a lot of retransmissions. In fact, that, I would tell you that is a wireless environment that sucks. <laughs> um, we can, as we start to have a look at some of these things, you, you start to see, you know, the retry percentage on some of the channels was like 90% retransmissions. Um, they had so much co-channel interference, they had an absolute lousy Wi-Fi environment. So is my job done? Not quite. Because what was the problem? They were getting delays. Never forget what the problem you're troubleshooting is. What I now need to determine is, is it causing that delay? I don't know. They've got a lousy RF environment, but is that the problem or is it not? So let's take a look at um, a slightly more filtered down view of this same data. Um, when I just select the client I was following around, and I've also um, put in the pre-shared key and decrypted his traffic, okay? just to make things a bit easier. I've also, um, I've made a note of the exact time when the problem occurred as well. So let me just look that up because we'll get to the packet we need to see a little bit quicker in that respect. I put the right. Here we go. So we go to the time when the problem occurred. And okay, I've got a lot of TCP data. Can I make some more sense of what I see in this trace file? Here we go. So Looking at one of the packets, what you'll see, it's just TCP data, but there's, in the ASCII text here, which might be hard for you to see, I'll zoom in in a minute, there is a, um, the message that the handheld is sending to the server, and I'd quite like to be able to see that, and it's in this data element, so I'm just going to change what the decoder is, and I'm going to cho choose decoder, and I'm going to pick um, text lines only. What that gives me is it now puts the text as a field, and because it's a field, I can add it as a decode column. Because I can add it as a decode column, I can now see the message that's being transmitted. And again, I'm going to drag this over a little bit. We'll get rid of that cause one. Um, A few other things I might look at while looking at this trace file um, that I want to show you. The flags column, where it's got a little plus, it tells me it's a retransmission. I was trying to zoom in again for you guys. Where there's a little plus, it tells me it's a retry. This number here is the IP identifier. Every packet that an IP the st stack sends out, it assigns an identifier to it. The next packet will go up by one, the next one by one, the next one by one. So I can tell if packets have been retransmitted and they've got the same at layer two, 
they'll have the same IP ID. If it's a TCP retransmission, the IP ID will change. So that tells me some information about the packet. Um, the flow ID is up there as well, which tells me is it part of the same TCP conversation. So one thing I can see is this message that's been sent from the scanner is definitely been retried. Look at all the retries. Same IP ID, and it gets retried, it gets retried, and it's, these retransmissions go on and on. And we'll just try and follow them through a bit. And they keep, it keeps getting retried. This packet is an acknowledgement. So we see one acknowledgement from the AP. The client never saw it because it carried on retransmitting the packet. Shows you a bit about its RF environment. Retry, retry, retry. And so it goes on. We get another packet that's part of another conversation, so we're going to ignore it um, because it's 311, not 312. And then we get a driven IP ID, but the same message from the same client. We're seeing at that point a TCP retransmission. It's tried retransmitting it so many times, it's failed. It's now not got a TCP acknowledgement back, so we're seeing the TCP retry. And eventually, as we go down this trace file, what you will see is eventually we get the response back from the server, which is retried, retried, it doesn't get there. Eventually we see a TCP retransmission from the server and we get an acknowledgement back. So was that, where did our delay occur? Where did our five, six second delay occur in that timing? Let's have a look. I'm just gonna zoom out. So there's a really cool little field called relative time and that so if I go back to the beginning of all those retries, the first packet, and I'm just going to right click and say set relative packet. All my timing columns are going to now be relative to that column. So how long after that frame did it occur? So we can see, I'll try and zoom in again a little bit for you guys, just one second. We can see that when we look at the relative column, the retry, wireless retries happen incredibly fast. Incredibly fast. Um, that they're, you know, 0 0.02 of a second. And even when we get to the TCP retransmission, the wireless device doing a TCP retransmission, it still took 0 0.29 of a second to do a TCP retransmission. We've not got a five second delay yet, have we? Then what happens? The response from the client then comes back a whole 3.1 seconds afterwards. So what occurred in that time and that was retried three times. And then the TCP retransmission from the server from when we first sent that first frame was nine seconds later. So that is a nine second delay. Okay, that's where the delays come in, but it seems to be coming more on the server end. Let's have a quick look just to finish off at the server trace file. Um, and see if it will make any more sense. So here is, here is what the application server showed. And again, I'll just look up which um, packet we need to be looking at here. There we go. So, again, we're going to do the same thing as we did before. We're going to just look at the messages so it's a bit easier to see. So I'm going to add that as a decode column. And this is hopefully going to be a lot easier to see. Um, I'm going to make that my relative packet again. 
Just set up the same thing. Here's my relative time. I'll move it over here. And we'll put the IP identifier in here so we can see it too. And then I'll zoom in for you guys. So I can see that initial query come from the AP. Now remember what did the AP, what did the client do? It retransmitted, it retransmitted, it retransmitted it lots and lots of times and it never got there so it sent a TCP retransmission. But what we see on the wired side is although the client never got an acknowledgement back, the AP received it, sent an ACK and forwarded it on because we actually see the packet get to the application server and it responds with the right response in a really timely manner, 0.04 seconds. Perfect, no application delay there. But we know that that'll have never received a client because the client was too busy retransmitting the initial request. And eventually, it sends a TCP retransmission, so the AP receives a frame again, sends it onto this server, which is here, but this time, it takes it three seconds to respond. The application server goes, well, doesn't know what to do with that second request because it's already responded. And it's obviously in some sort of state machine where if it receives a request for the second time, it takes it quite a long time to respond. And then what we know is that never receives, gets sent to the client because it tries to retransmit it from the wireless environment. Oh, bear with me a second. And it then has to do a TCP retransmission. Now remember the wireless client and its TCP retransmission, it took about 0.2 seconds. Look how long it takes the server to do a TCP retransmission. It's already had three seconds, so it's about another six seconds for it to do a TCP retransmission. Um, and that's where the delay is happening to the user. So in summary then, what's going on here? And who's at fault? You've got a really unstable RF environment. But you've also got an application server that doesn't respond very well to, can't cope with basically transmit, doing its application over an unstable network where it has to do TCP retransmissions. It has to maybe answer a query it's had before. So there's two issues here that are causing the effect to the user. And it might, and you could argue, you fix the RF environment and this problem will go away. Or you could fix this problem and make it so the application is more robust on an unstable environment and the problem goes away. But it's neither, you can't finger point necessarily just at one area. There's two things not necessarily operating as they should. Um, and, and you've got to keep that open mind. So I hope that was interesting and a little bit of a view into the way I troubleshoot and how I look at trace files. Um, I'm over time, so if you have any questions, catch me. I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. It's okay to be over time, actually, because uh, we started early. Perfect. So, so just uh, a question on the two previous problems where uh, the QoS uh, changing yeah. and the data rate uh, being different for client and AP, uh, like why were those problems happening? So the um, cross problem was happening because of a, um, a misconfigured um, switch which was stripping the cross markings off and not forwarding it on properly. Um, the data rate, I believe, was um, a, a bug in the infrastructure equipment. And it was always sending, well, I say a bug, it was always sending um, anything in the voice queue at the lowest data rate. You could argue it was doing that because it was the most robust data rate, and now you might say, well, that's actually not a bad thing to do. But I learned from talking to the vendor that that's not how it was meant to work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, robustness is yeah. gained, but air time is lost at Correct. the same time. Yeah. Wow, well, uh, I just have to say, man crush. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other? Oh.
before we uh, break for lunch, uh, so, sorry, take a quick break. Uh, any other questions to Peter while we have him here? Yes. What was the fix? Um, the, the question was, what was the fix where you had the application server versus the output environment? Um, the, the, the organization didn't want to pay for me to go in and fix the IRF environment. Um, and the application team said there was nothing wrong with our application. <laughs> and um, so um, I, I, I suggested the other alternative would be move to five gig. Um, and then you've not got, you eliminate the really bad IRF environment, which is what they did in the end. Um, because they didn't want me to go and fix a 2.4 gig. They, we, we, I convinced them eventually to move the handhelds that were having a problem to the 5 gig band. So we, we effectively fixed the RF environment by moving frequency. Yeah, so the question was, do we sometimes miss packets when capturing? Um, the question is yes. Um, the, the answer is yes, because NIC cards only see things from their point of view, and you've always got to remember that. So you've got to, when looking at capture, you've got to look at the surrounding packets to identify maybe what packets did I miss. So if I see, um, you know, if, if I, I, I might, if I see retransmissions, whether I saw the original packet or not, it means that the end user didn't see it. If I am seeing um, packets going, but maybe not seeing the acknowledgements, but it's not being retransmitted, I maybe have to assume that, you know, that, that packet did get there. Um, but m my thing with that is try and view it from, I like to be um, close to the client and view it from the client's point of view. So I would literally walk around with the client and the closer you can get to the object you're trying to capture packets from, the less likely it is you're going to miss packets. But you, you will still miss packets, and you've just got to be aware of that when you're looking at your trace files and accounting for that in, in your analysis. I always say that the packets never lie, but our interpretation of the packets often do. So, um, so, so just be careful to not misinterpret the packets because you're, you're actually missing a few packets, or you know, you've captured a CSE packet, but it really wasn't. So just be like that. A quick follow-up question on that. Is there better and worse capture adapters? And what do you use and what do you uh, not use? So yes, there's better capture adapters than others. Um, I, I use the, um, uh, what, what is the Omni adapter from Seviets? Um, it's, it's also the Netgear A6210 um, adapter. Um, it's a two special stream AC adapter for most of, most of the time, because most client traffic is only two special stream, that's good enough. Um, I also capture a lot from APs. And I great believe if I can is getting AP captures um, and because they actually give you a better view, especially APs that will operate as an AP while giving you packets. So there's a few vendors that do that. Um, and those APs are great because I can actually see the traffic, the Wi-Fi traffic it's sending to and from the clients. Um, and I, I capture a lot from APs for reliable packet captures without packets missing. Uh, should we break for lunch or any, uh, one, one more final question? Oh, sorry, sorry, not lunch, just, just a... Uh, <laughs> I'm a vendor, so I represent the vendor, so that's what we do. We overpromise, right? <laughs> so, uh, short break, and uh, I believe back at 10:30. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How about one more round of applause? Do we want more of this kind of stuff? <laughs> <laughs>